Hi, hello everyone. My name is Andrea Macho, and I'm at the New York University in Abu Dhabi. And if you're curious to know why the heck there is a New York University in Abu Dhabi, I'm happy to answer those questions offline later on at the coffee. Since I moved there, usually my affiliation tracks more questions than my science, which is a bit strange. So we're seeing we have a lot of information on a prediction from cosmology on linear scales, on large scales. And uh, we have also sub, uh, almost linear theory to propagate those information. But when we move to nonlinear scales, we have to face a very hard reality that our model, the lambda called Dramata, doesn't make any prediction per se. And all the information we have, they all come from numerical simulations. Okay, so we have no a priori model for dark matter distribution or clustering in collapsed objects. Or we can do numerical simulation, that's one simulation, that's a formation of a halo. And we learn a lot of stuff on the formation of dark matter. For example, dark matter acquires angular momentum through tidal torques. Dark matter, it forms in a hierarchical way, so we have small structure forming first, then they merge to go to a much larger structure, and so far, so on. One thing we have learned, which I think is very interesting, is that at the end of the day, dark matter halos are almost self-similar structure. What I mean with that is that if I show you a picture like this, you cannot tell me what are you looking at, right? That thing could be anything. It could be a galaxy cluster, it could be a group, it could be a galaxy, like our own Milky Way, it could be a dwarf galaxy, you cannot tell me. And the reason is this kind of self-similarity of dark matter halos. And that self-similarity is usually well uh, presented by the universal dark matter density profile. That means that if I plot the density of dark matter as a function of radius in a collapsed object, all the dark matter halos, regardless of their mass, can well be fitted by very simple analytical prediction. This is the famous Navarro Frank and White prediction, which is top there, the Inasto one. There is one parameter, which is the concentration, which is the relation between the mass at the video radius and the mass in some inside radius, which is, which is mass dependent, so somehow breaks slightly the self-similarity. But if you look at this relation, this is the concentration mass relation, this relation is very, very shallow. Now, when we plot it, it looks there's a large correlation, but if you look at the orders of magnitude here, you have a factor of two. You have five orders of magnitude. In fact, the slope of this relation is roughly 0 0.1. So, practically, you need to increase the mass of 10 orders of magnitude in order to change the concentration by a factor of 10. So, I spend my fair amount of time on this relation, but it's, it's a very weak one, this correlation. So I can, can somehow say that if you restrict yourself to a not too large dark matter uh, range, you are in a sort of self-similar behavior. That example here is a set of circular velocities for dark matter halo. So you have radius, you have here circular velocity. Circular velocity is just another way to recast the mass. It's simply the velocity that you construct from G, M, and R. It doesn't mean that the dark matter halo is rotating at that velocity, not by any means. And you see, all those curves are self-similar in the sense they all have the same shape. They have steep rising, a peak, and a flat or decreasing part. In fact, I can collapse all of them in practically one single curve if I simply renormalize the radius by, for example, the radius of the galaxy, and the circular velocity by the circular velocity of the galaxy. And now you see they all fall down in, a, in one single curve, and the scatter you see is simply due by the scatter in the concentration parameters as a fixed halo mass. This is beautiful, but has a huge problem. And the problem is that galaxies are not self-similar. Okay? Dark matter halos are self-similar in the sense they all have roughly the same rotation curves. Galaxies are not. And this is very well illustrated by this plot. It's a paper from Oman and collaborators, 2015. What you see here, those are Fourier uh, galaxies. Those are the points with the arrow bars. And those galaxies, they have roughly the same stellar mass or, or circular velocity. So they should live in very similar dark matter halos. And then what the uh, Oman and collaborators did, they pick dark matter halos which have roughly the same mass, so they match the flat part of the rotation curve. And you see this for some galaxies, you can find a match, so it's steep rising and then a flat part in the rotation curve. But for some other galaxies, like this one is a beautiful example, IC2574, this galaxy has, has a slowly rising rotation curve, and there's no way you can fit it with an NFW profile, so the typical profile you see for dark matter halos. And the reason is that, as I mentioned, dark matter halos are not flexible. They are self-similar, the structure, it's fixed. So can you zoom in on this galaxy? And again, this is the exact same plot I showed you before, and this, this is telling you that the given radius, the dark matter from n-body simulations, from the prediction for cold dark matter, dark matter, they have way too much mass than what is seen in this galaxy. In fact, this is the prediction from the n-body, just to mark it again, and you see it has quite 
a difference in dark matter content because of, from this formula here, you see that an excess in velocity means that the fixed radius you have an excess in mass. This is excess mass is well known because this is the CASP core problem that has been brought up in 1999 by uh, 1994 by Ben Moore and then keep coming and going from uh, the literature. So another way to see this problem is the following. I show you before this universal density profile, and now you can see that the amount of mass you have in the center is related by the slope of this profile, which I call alpha. See, the slope is negative, and it's usually called cusp in the sense that this slope is around minus 1.5. And I can make the prediction from this slope alpha as a function of the place where I measure it, and what I get is this black line from cold dark matter. So that's a prediction of the model. That's where the data are. And you see the data are very far away from the prediction of the model. That if I show you something like this, it would immediately tell me that this model is a very bad representation of the data. So the model, it can be correct. So how to break this self-similarity? Well, there are a lot of ideas around. The first one is that you can work on the dark sector. And here you have a lot of different possibilities. For example, you can have self-interacting dark matter. This brings a cross-section into the problem, which is a scale. And this scale is going to break the self-similarity. Same happens for fuzzy dark matter or axions dark matter. Those are all models that behave like a quantum condensate on very small scales. They have quantum pressure. There's a De Broglie length, which is the order of kiloparsec. So again, you bring a number into the model. Warm dark matter would do the same because of a uh, cutoff in the power spectrum. And you can keep going. Right? You name it dark matter. I mean, there's plenty of options in the, in the literature. The more, the more options the particle physicists at the moment. But there's a big elephant in the room that people usually try to sweep under the carpet. And the reason is that you rather prefer to say something new on dark matter than get your hands dirty with galaxy formation. Because galaxy formation is something that you can't avoid. Okay? I was comparing galaxies with dark matter. And that's similar to telling you that since you use galaxies as your uh, traces, it's better if you add them to the game. And we can do that. Because in the last years, we have developed a lot of uh, techniques and calculations to add baryons and to do galaxy formation in computer simulation. So what you have here is the same, oh, thank you very much, the same movie as before. This is a dark matter, but now it's coupled with the evolution of the gas, which is temperature uh, color-coded. And here you see the stars. And now you see that for every dark matter, look at the satellite, it's coming in. It has its own gas, cold and hot, and has its own star. Uh, component. Now, this dark matter halo, unfortunately, is not going to survive towards the end, so this gun is going to be destroyed. And it's going to be destroyed in dark matter and in stars after a few passages. And so, so the gas is redistributed. One thing you have to keep in mind, unfortunately, is that we cannot do galaxy simulation for first principles. For example, one thing uh, we have to do in galaxy formation is star formation. So we, have, we start from a universe that only has gas and dark matter, and somehow we have to form stars. So how we do it, it's very schematic. So we have gas elements, gas particles. Typical mass, let's say it's a 10 to the force. This is like a cloud of gas. And we say that when this gas, cold, this gas is going to be cold, so below some temperature threshold and, and dense, above some density threshold, we're going to transform this gas, part of it, into stars. Then what happens is that this is a star cluster. It's not a single star. So part of its components are going to be massive stars, and the massive stars are going to explode the supernovae. When they explode the supernovae, they put energy back into the system, and so this energy goes to my gas particle, which is going to be moved to a new temperature and density. Okay, that's how we do it. That seems reasonable. But now, that's a big problem. This is the forming region. Okay, this is the Orion Nebula. What you see here is young stars which are forming, and you see are shredding apart the gas envelope around them. This is my red particle, yellow particle. The problem is that all of this it's encompassed in a single particle of our simulation. So we cannot see any of the beautiful physics that happens in the Hubble picture underneath it, because practically all of this is encompassed in a single element. Of course, it doesn't prevent us to run tons of simulations. So that's going to present my own simulations called the Nihao Project. Nihao is an acronym, stands for Numerical Investigation of Hundred Astrophysical Objects, and it happens to mean hello in Chinese. So what we did in this project, we ran tons of galaxies. So we rerun more than 120 very high resolution galaxies. And the reason is that only in this way we can try to compensate the, uh, the known self similarity of galaxies. We need a large statistical sample. We go from massive ellipticals, like down here, now you see an edge on, to very tiny dwarf galaxies up there. Now, every time somebody shows you a beautiful simulation of a galaxy, the first thing you have to ask yourself is that, but are those galaxies realistic? Because on the contrary of simulating dark matter halos, we have a lot of freedom. When you simulate galaxies, you have to face that there are tons of observations for galaxies. 
Ganses obey many scaling relations. Ganses have particular properties for their uh, color, luminosity, chemistry, and so forth, so on. So if anyone, including me, shows you some simulation, the first thing you have to do is that, okay, simulation is nice, I agree, but are your galaxies realistic? So the first step you want to do, if you want to do any cosmology, is to validate your galaxies against observations. And we, we can use many, uh, many of those properties. I mean, the basic one, in my opinion, is the, the so-called halo mass, stellar mass relation. So you have here the viral mass of a halo, that's the stellar mass of the galaxy that lives in a halo, and real galaxies should live around this black line with this error, gray error bar. And you see our galaxies, there's the blue points, those are Nihau simulated galaxies, they do an extremely good job. And then I can keep going on. So for example, there's a Tully Fisher relation of our galaxy. And again, uh, red, you have the observations, black is Nihau. You see, you can nail down at the same moment the slope, the scatter, and the zero point of the relation. That's very cool. Same happens, for example, if I move to the gas. This is relation between cold gas mass and gas this size. Uh, squares and Nihau, black, it's observation. And again, zero point scatter and, z and uh, slope. So we have produced a fair amount of papers on Nihau. I'm happy to discuss all of them, depending if you're interested more on the galaxy side or the cosmology side. And what I want to talk here is now go back to my initial issues about the self similarity of dark matter halos. So one thing is that before people were comparing uh, dark matter halos with galaxies, trying to put them on the same footage, for example, using circular velocity, but now we can do much better, right? We can compare apples with apples. So we have real galaxies here, simulated galaxy there. We can apply the same technique and see what happens. And that's when things get interesting. This is the same the plot I showed you before. There's a density profile of dark matter halo. That's from the M body. And if I look at the slope in the center, it is minus 1.3. Uh, that's bad, right? Because I remember you this plot. I remind you this plot is radius versus alpha, this slope. That's a prediction from cold dark matter, the black line. Now what happens is that my galaxy falls down there, right? And this is very far away from the data. OK, what happens when I put variance into the game? Well, then things become interesting. Because if I do the profile of my dark matter inside this galaxy, suddenly it has a flattened inner part. It's called a core. That means that somehow the galaxy formation has been able to change my alpha to something like minus 0 0.1. And this is great, because if I now go to my plot, boom, it goes exactly where the data are. OK? And now what I can do, I can look into the Nihau database. I can choose galaxies which are LSBs, low surface brightness. So I try to do proper matching to what however, the observers provide me, and that's what I get. Nihau analysis, they all add up here. And if you wonder why they don't go inside, that's just a resolution issue. Right? I don't have enough resolution to trust my alpha at any point inside. Now, the question is that how could it be the variance, which are subdominant, can alter the distribution of the dark matter? And I'll try to explain it with this movie. This movie shows the gas content of a dwarf galaxies during its formation. And now what you see is that the gas is doing two things. It's going inside the halo, then it gets very hot, uh, sorry, very cold, dense, and it gets transformed into stars. And what happens to those stars, they put energy back as supernovae. So the supernova spans the gas. Uh, 50 kiloparsecs, I think. I can check. So this is a, roughly the video radius of, of, uh, of the dwarf galaxy. And so what the, galaxy, what the gas is doing is going in and out, in and out, in and out. And you can think that that thing can cancel out, because when the gas goes in, the dark matter sees a deeper potential. When the gas goes out, the dark matter sees a shallower potential. Now, what has been shown is that the key point here is that the gas goes in and out, especially out during the expansion, on a time scale which is much shorter than the dynamical time of the dark matter, which you can think about the orbital time or the free fall time. As a consequence, the dark matter is forced to react in a non adiabatic way. That means that every time the gas goes out, the dark matter is pushed out, because since it keeps, it keeps the same kinetic energy for a shallower potential, it moves out. But then, when it tries to move back in, it cannot move as much as it was moved out. And the reason is that the process, whole process, is non-adiabatic. So time after time, dark matter get kicked, gets kicked outside. That means that uh, this uh, reaction of the dark matter to the uh, baryon, to the galaxy formation, uh, can be parameterized very nicely by this simple parameter, which is the stellar mass over the halo mass of my galaxy. You can think at the bottom, uh, the denominator, like the halo mass, that's simply the gravity which tries to keep the galaxy together. Where the numerator of the stellar mass is somehow related by the amount of supernovae, so explosion I had that moved my gas around. And in fact, and this is alpha again, is the slope of the density profile. 
If I plot this for a Nihau analysis, that's what I got. The black points are the M body simulation, and of course they all stick around minus 1.5. And the red points are the results from our simulation. There are three regimes which are very interesting. The first one is that the very low masses, there is no effect. So now you see each, 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 each um, couple of points, it's a pair. This is exactly the same object that run with galaxy formation, without galaxy formation. And you see here, they're all together. That means that the very low fraction of stellar mass over halo mass, galaxy formations don't do much. And the reason is pretty clear. I have too few supernova explosion, too few energy injection for the given uh, potential of my dark matter. Then if I move up, there's a place where I have the maximum reaction. So that's the maximum difference between a universe which is only dark matter and a real universe with galaxy formation. And that's where I have my expansion, exactly the plot I showed you before. And then, interestingly, when you move back down here, that's practically the scale of the Milky Way, the red points go below, below the black points. That means that the, my dark matter is actually contracted. So I have more dark matter inside than what I would have without galaxy formation. And here, the reason is that I'm forming so many stars. You know, the stars, they work as an anchor for the potential. So what they do, they attract more dark matter inside. So what is interesting here, I mean, I can do the same plot as a function of stellar mass, doesn't change much. Now what you can think is that the galaxy, this is a function of, this is the same plot as a function of stellar mass. A galaxy will move, right, in its age. We go from here to there growing in stellar mass. So the galaxy will go through these phases. That means that what you have is that there is a continuous creation and destruction of cores in the dark matter. In fact, what I have here is this function of redshift or time, uh, the evolution for two different galaxies. So look at this galaxy here. This galaxy here, which is the blue line, arrives at redshift zero with a very caspy profile. There's a gray area here, which is my resolution limit. So anytime a point drops below this resolution limit, you can think as an infinite caspy because I can't resolve anything. But well, you see that this galaxy, which today is, has a very uh, dense dark matter profile, it had the formation of large cores, this is the size of the core in kiloparsec during the past. And you look also at the red galaxies, keep going up and down, up and down. So what's happening, that if I go back to my initial plot, there is no such a thing as universal dark matter profile. The whole idea which dark matter is built on, this NFW profile, breaks down very badly for galaxy formation. And this profile is no universal, not as halo mass, nor in time. So the same galaxies will go through different phases and we'll see his potential keep changing. So the moment in which you capture a galaxy can, be, uh, can give you different results. Okay, let me go back to my initial problem with the rotation curves. This is the paper by Oman 2015. Now what I didn't tell you is that here you see there's a black and there's also a green line. If you squint your eyes, you can see there are two lines, but actually they're one on top of the other. And that's what they get from their simulation with order dynamics. So actually, in their simulation, dark matter is not changing. And that's the statement they make at the end. They say current simulations fail to reproduce diversity in the effect of variance. Actually, I like to claim that that's a problem with their simulation. The ego simulations say fail, because if you look at our simulation, they do an amazing job. These points here are exactly the same points, and here, just a different surface, this is sparks. And what you see here is the density profile in one of a galaxy. That's a dark matter only which is very similar to this one, and it fails badly to reproduce the point. But now this is the profile I get from the hydro, which goes amazingly through the point. And this is most interesting also because we never aim to reproduce these specific galaxies whose name is up here, right? We just run 100 galaxies. We happen to have one which is very, very similar. That also tells you the importance of the diversity. This is a, uh, the plot that shows you this breaking of the self-similarity. So what I have here is the radius. And here I have the ratio between the circular velocity in the hydro simulations versus the one in the dark matter. If there was no breaking in self similarity, all these lines, those are different galaxies, will all line up around the one line, right? Because one of this will be the self similarity. I mean, collapsing everything in a single line. But what you see here, that due to galaxy formation, this thing opens up. Okay, and now you have some galaxies which are below. That means they are uh, expanded. Some galaxies that are above, that means they are contracted, and that's my changing as a function of stellar mass. <laughs> so but that seems then to put a cosmologist, because I, I like cosmology, in kind of a corner, because if variants can modify the profile of dark matter halos, where do we look if we wanted to constrain cosmology? And uh, this, the thing is not hopeless, because there is a very sweet spot. So if I go back to this plot here, there's a function of stellar mass, this reaction, you see that if I go stellar mass is below 10 to the 6, there's practically no effect. Okay, so those halos are more likely to retain their initial cosmologically imprinted dark matter distribution. 
Here we only have few points, so what we did, we went and we increased the number of simulations. That brings me back to one of my first feature. That's the halo I showed you at the beginning. I was asking you which kind of halo was that. It could be a galaxy cluster. Well, if you look at its baryonic content, you will immediately realize that this thing, it's a tiny dwarf galaxy. In fact, if this thing was to be a galaxy cluster, you would see stars in each of the satellite galaxies. So if this is a galaxy cluster, a galaxy like here could be as big as the Milky Way. This thing here is actually the halo of a very dwarf galaxy. This galaxy, this halo has such a low mass that only the central concentration has been able to accrete gas and make stars. All the rest of the sub halos, they're all dark, right? They're all depleted of gas. And the reason is that the UV background that kicks in at the ionization has wiped out the gas from all those halos. So, that's again the breaking of the degeneracy. Now, this thing could be anything, this thing is a dwarf galaxy, you can tell immediately. And so, if you go again, this is again another plot of this alpha versus M star. And you have, for each galaxy, you have two points, a black one, which is dark matter only, and a colorful one, which is the hydro simulation. And if you see that if you, if you restrict yourself uh, yeah, to this part here of the plus or below 10 to the 6, all galaxies are retaining their initial dark matter distribution. That means if you want to look for a real challenge for cold dark matter, that's what you, oops, oops. That's what you have to, to do. You have to look for an ambiguous detection of a deviation on very small scales. Okay, that's very where, that's where you want to do cosmology, at very small scales. So that brings me to my conclusion, since I got the zero point, I'll put them all there. And uh, the matter distribution is affected by baryons. There's no such thing, universal profile. At the moment, there are no real challenge for cold dark matter. So there's no push from the data side to go beyond cold dark matter, because all the issues can be resolved when you include variants, and there's many more plots I can show you. And if you want to challenge dark matter, you have to look at very small galaxies. And at the moment, I think the jury is still out. But most important, if you want to do any comparison, please compare galaxies with galaxies and not with dark matter halos. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. You have questions for a couple of questions we can take. Yeah, Asim. Very nice talk. So Thank you. for your, uh, for the comparison for rotation curves, do you also account for things like inclination effects, how you extract yes. observationally? So you're doing a full apples to apples comparison? We, we, we did both ways. So we did by taking the results that the observers told me have been corrected by inclination, and we did it going the other way around. So we tried to apply and the two things they, they, they add up. Not maybe galaxy per galaxy, but in a statistical way where there is no bias in the, in the observations. Uh, here, uh, so uh, I was I was wondering uh, when when you looked at uh, this individual galaxy, if you actually have a simulation where you have satellite galaxy as well, will you uh, expect an impact on velocity dispersion on these things because of baryonic feedback? An impact on what? On velocity dispersion because of the change in the core yes, density yes, profile. Yes, dispersion change. So we have Milky Ways with very high resolution. We can resolve the satellites. And we saw that in a like LMC kind of object, there's a change in the velocity dispersion. The velocity dispersion gets lower. But for satellites, it's much more important the effect of tidal heating and stripping. So the baryons are subdominant with respect to the orbits in which you put the satellite. That makes a much more difference, a much more a stronger effect in dissolving the stellar component and lowering the uh, velocity dispersion of the stars. Yeah. Uh, so very nice talk, but uh, quick question. Uh, so different galaxies go through basically different histories, and that uh, so when we see them today, they may have a core or a cusp depending on what happened to them. Is there a way of selecting galaxies which would reveal that, okay, galaxies in such and such environment? Yeah. Yeah, you, you want to look, if you want to look at galaxies that might have a core, you want to look at gas reach with early uh, recent star formation episodes. For example, there is a class of galaxies which is called ultra diffuse galaxies. Those are galaxies that have very low surface brightness. And we wrote a paper about that. Our explanation, those galaxies recently went through a very large episode of star formation. And then you not only expand the gas and the dark matter, you also expand the stars. And for example, UDGs, ultra diffuse galaxies, they tend to be gas rich and have early uh, recent episodes of star formation. So there are ways to discriminate. Um, is there some effect where you can directly see the forcing of the, um, due to the 
time varying potential, um, does that have an effect, a lasting effect on the galaxy? I mean, you described the change of um, the core, then cusp, then core, and so forth. But uh, in some sense, you now have a time varying potential. Does that uh, change something characteristic that would you, you could use to test? Um, as, as I was saying, the only thing we saw is that if you have a very large outburst, you might affect the stars. So you lower the same effect you see in the dark matter, you also see in the stars. So that can explain this class of galaxies, very diffuse galaxies. Beyond that, it's very hard to see anything. And, and the reason is that uh, dark matter is in a, in a very different kind of orbit. The stars are localized. Dark matter is more on tube-like orbits, so there's much more exclusion. So they, they see the potential in a much different way. Okay. I don't have a very nice description. No, I don't have a nice thing to look at, unfortunately. Maybe one last question. Uh, okay. We don't have time. Where? Me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the dwarf galaxy, which had this rising rotation curve until 8 kiloparsec, how did you manage to get rid of the badions? Was it still, I mean, dark matter, was it stripped? Was it a satellite? No, 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 dark matter is pushed out by the baryonic feedback. When the gas goes out, the dark matter goes also out. And the reason the dark matter goes out is because it sees this time-changing potential, and then the, when the potential is uh, shallower, the dark matter, since it has retained its kinetic energy, has to move out on the orbit. But why doesn't it happen for other galaxies? Sure, it happens, so there is a specific place in the stellar mass where this happens for every galaxy. And that's exactly why people keep finding galaxies with this rising rotation curves, uh, slowly rising rotation curves. There's a lot of difference from galaxy to galaxy, of course. So the, 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 the size of this effect, the magnitude of this effect is different, because it depends on the star formation rate, which depends on the infall emergence of us all. Okay, let's thank uh, Andreas.